Thank you, Paul. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Paul for inviting me to come along. He invited me to participate in this, knowing very, very well that I was likely to disagree with quite a lot of what he was going to say. So uh, that, that was that was uh, courageous of you. But I, I'm, I'm not going to take a particularly contrarian position on this. But I will be arguing um, quite um, quite clearly, I think, that I see nothing particularly disruptive in this technology. Certainly not disruptive in the Clayton Christensen sense of disruptive. It's not going to change fundamentally the way we approach what we're doing. Well, like a lot of other people, you know, when it comes to um, talking about ChatGPT, um, I asked ChatGPT to do some of the work for me. So to give an idea, I asked it to come up with a title for my short presentation. And it, it, it offered uh, this uh, game changer or a gimmick. It took me quite a while to get it to come up with the suggestion. It came up with some, some really dull stuff. I said, I want something a bit more witty, a bit more snappy. And this was finally the wittiest and the snappiest thing it, would, it could come up with. Um, for this sort of too long didn't read or too long couldn't be bothered to listen uh, kind of people out there, the answer to the question, is it a game changer or a gimmick? Well, I would argue it's actually neither of these. It's neither. Um, OK, let's, let's move on. I'm going to be fairly brief in this, in this presentation. The first point I want to make is, is that um, ChatGPT is very new. I mean, you, you see the Wikipedia entry here. It's talking about how it appeared in 20, uh, November 2022. Now, there have been other similar models out there. I've been playing around with, um, with one called, I forget what it's called now, Neuro, I'm sorry, Neuroflex or something of that kind. Now, that's maybe a drug um, for quite some time. But this one is different because it's free or it's free for the moment. I think we need to remember that it is very early days. Um, I'm going to suggest or argue that the, the key to understanding chat GPT is as a tool. And as a tool, I think we could compare it to other tools which changed the way we worked. Tools like Google, uh, which suddenly made life very different, certainly for anyone involved in the production of materials. Tools like YouTube, even tools like Word. Um, but also tools that you get on a standard smartphone, things like voice recorder or, or camera. And it's taken really quite a long time for people to come up with um, a really rich variety of the, the sorts of things that we can do in language teaching, which use these tools. So I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, as time goes by and assuming that we still have access to a piece of software like ChatGPT for free, uh, that people will be coming up with more interesting stuff. The, the, the main bulk of what I'm going to say is I'm going to simply describe a number of activities which I uh, have come across in, in, in various sources online which are using ChatGPT. These are activities which I like. I'm going to simply describe them uh, and then make some sort of commentary on these activities as I go. These um, activities, as I say, are drawn from the work of other people. I've put together a, a, a Word document. Paul, what, what did we decide in the end with this? We're going to make this available? Uh, yes, um, we'll be sharing some resources uh, at the Tiltal homepage and the Tiltal Facebook group after the forum is finished. Yeah. OK, lovely. So this, this will be accessible afterwards. And, um, and it, it's linking to what I think is some of the best stuff out there. Um, some names I'll mention now, a guy called Sam Gravel, American working in um, Germany, and Svetlana Kandibovic. I'm not sure about your pronunciation, Svetlana, because I know you're here, um, who's also doing some interesting work. So I'm going to be linking to that. So here are the ideas that I'd like to describe, and I've categorized them uh, really quite simply. I'm starting with texts as vehicles of information. And I'm starting with texts as vehicles of information, to use that terminology, uh, because in many ways, uh, it would seem that that is what most people are doing with chat GPT at the moment, they're using it to generate texts for people to read. But I've also started with it because um, there are still plenty of people who would argue that in terms of language acquisition, the single most significant factor in learning a language is having uh, extensive and multiple opportunities uh, to interact with comprehensible text of one kind or another. So this whole business of providing access to comprehensible text is something which people have picked up on very fast with chat GPT. Um, at the moment, the interface is, is, uh, is just text, but it is a relatively trivial matter to convert that text into spoken language. And it is a relatively trivial matter to convert any spoken uh, your spoken input into a textual format 
that ChatGPT can process. It's, it's not difficult to do. And it is likely uh, before long that there will be a, a, a spoken interface. So at the moment then it's reading, uh, but that is unlikely to continue for very long. At the same time, uh, the people at OpenAI are talking about the possibility, not just of generating written text, but video text in the near future. Um, the technology is, is there, it's, it's extremely complex and extremely expensive, but we could imagine a situation where rather than um, asking a question of ChatGPT, um, it would actually produce an animated or, or, yeah, I suppose an animated video response. Perhaps uh, it could even produce a 20 minute webinar slot of this kind. Why not? Either using a uh, kind of quite sophisticated technology to make it look as though I'm speaking or having some sort of avatar representing my face. So those are the, the ways that people are using it most of the moment and the way it's likely to go. And I think this is, this is significant, but there is one big, one very big caveat. AI is also being used to generate music and it's also being used to generate art and it's being used already to generate a video of various kinds. One of the things though that we know about this is that however, uh, immediately interesting uh, AI generated image is. When you know that it's been generated by AI, you begin to lose your interest. And the same is true with music. I could play, for example, two pieces of music, one by Bach and one generated by AI in the style of Bach, and you might find them equally interesting. But one of the things that has been established quite clearly in terms of psychology is when we know that something is artificial intelligence, we lose interest in it. And this kind of provides a, a big challenge for AI generated text of whatever kind. It becomes more interesting if we are unethical and lie about it and pretend it's been written by somebody else. And there might be an argument for being uh, to lie about it in order to, to push the motivation levels, because if we're honest, the motivation levels are likely to drop off or disappear. So those are my kind of reservations about that. But um, here are a couple of ideas that I've uh, come across, which, which I rather liked. Um, I'm describing them as um, exemplars rather than copy exactly as they are. The first one, and I say it's linked, uh, the link is on the handout, is from somebody called Andrew Heft. And he input the prompt, the following prompt. I'm trying to improve my understanding of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Develop a creative choose your own adventure story and keep asking me to choose an option before moving on to the next part of the story. So chat GPT seems to be able to do this quite well to, to, to create interactive text, which you uh, have some kind of part in, in deciding how far it goes. I'm not sure that I would want to trivialize the Arab Israeli context in this way, uh, the conflict in this way, but, but you could do it with anything else. So I really, really like the idea. I've not had, not had a chance to try it out yet, um, but this idea of interactive stories seems to me a good one. Of course, these things exist, maze stories, they've been around for quite a long time, but writing them takes forever. Uh, and then programming them, it takes a while if you're doing it online too. Um, this kind of thing is a fairly immersive activity. It's gonna work best with fiction. It's not gonna work terribly well um, with factual information. Um, it's going to work better, presumably, with younger learners than with older learners. Um, but it, it, it is a kind of fun thing to do. It lends itself well to classroom work, since if different uh, students are following different paths through the individualized stories, uh, it creates immediately a kind of jigsaw situation where they can then compare what they've discovered afterwards, share your story, and they'll all have different patterns. That seems to me a very rich way of spending quite a substantial amount of time in class, combining reading and listening, and of course, some listening as well. So I think that's a really lovely idea, using chat GPT to generate um, something interesting textually. A second idea, which I rather liked, um, uh, although it's very simple in many ways, it just has one um, added feature. And this is from somebody called Dustin Shamaul. I'm not sure about the pronunciation. And um, he wrote this as his prompt. Please write the first paragraph of a short story. The scenario is a dystopia where global warming and an atomic war has made Earth uninhabitable. So he goes through it paragraph by paragraph in this form. So there's some element of interactivity because you can push it in a particular direction. Um, but what I like about the uh, 
the added feature, if you like, is that he, his next prompt is, please provide the most difficult vocabulary in this text with translations. Um, this is um, something which ChatGPT doesn't do terribly well. Um, it really doesn't have much of a notion of, of level, uh, despite what uh, Paul was suggesting earlier on. It really doesn't do it terribly well. It will miss some difficult vocabulary and it will include others which are far too easy, as the example from Dustin Chamel on his video shows. But it does give you a start to this and it makes it quicker for a teacher to identify this vocabulary simply by doing editing. So the teacher has to come in, do some editing uh, because the, the software cannot do it reliably. And I will uh, suggest that it never will be able to. The idea of writing a text at B2 level um, is highly problematic um, because it presupposes that B2 is something which really is the same for everybody. And I'm not sure we could say that any given text for a particular reader would be at a particular level. It's, 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 it's more complex than that. Still, it's a nice idea. With a little bit of uh, teacher editing, you, could, you can tidy up the list. Uh, what Dustin then suggests is that you ask the, uh, the software to provide translations in the first language of the learners, which it will do very quickly. And then, of course, once you've got these keywords and the translations, you can simply export them into a flashcard system um, for spaced practice. So it's a nice little idea. So there's some good ones, I, I think quite good ones, using texts as vehicles of information. More often, I suppose, we are used to using, uh, more often and perhaps regrettably, we're used to using texts as linguistic objects. Um, there's, there's again a long history here how, how we might use texts or mind texts to find interesting linguistic features. Uh, but most of the texts that come in the published material, both online and off, um, starts from the kind of language that you want to show in the text, and then the text is written around it. As a course book writer, I've done this more often than I care to remember. I'm teaching, or well, we're presenting the present perfect, or whatever it may be, and we've got to write a text which includes at least five instances of it. Chat GPT can do this reasonably well. And Sam Gravel gave a really interesting example, I thought, with this particular approach. Uh, he teaches in a, in a business, uh, business English context. And he gave us a prompt, write me a list of the top 20 most important accounting terms in English and use those terms in a text about accounting in 2022. Then create a version where the terms are replaced with gaps. And he checked the uh, information that chat GPT came up with, the, the list that it came up with, with one of his students who works in accounting. And the, the feeling seems to be that chat GPT was able to do this quite well. So identifying key uh, terms and then writing texts which include them seems to work pretty well on chat GPT. Um, my, my third category is simplified, just checking the time simplified and elaborated texts. I mentioned just briefly earlier on that ChatGPT has a problem with, with levels. It understands ages much better than it understands levels as we would understand levels. And I think one of the reasons for that is that the data on which it's been trained is overwhelmingly American or presumably is American. So when it comes to language learning, it assumes that we're talking about English language learners in a North American context, rather than English language learners in some other kind of context. So it's, it's kind of used to the idea of you know, what, what kind of problems might an 11 year old English language learner in Detroit have, um, but it doesn't really do terribly well. And it probably never will be able to, to do terribly well with saying this is a B1 uh, learner of English with let's say Japanese as a first language who is 14 years old. There are too many variations there. So it can simplify texts. Um, and you, you see in the example that Paul gave where you ask it to write in the style of, that it can copy styles quite well. But it's a fairly crude approximation of styles. And when it comes to levels, it doesn't do it brilliantly. So you, you can ask it to, to produce simplified texts of a text that you input, but you'd have to check and you'd spend probably almost as much time checking it as you would rewriting it or editing it yourself. I think a more interesting uh, potential here is elaborated texts where you start off with a fairly simple text and ask it to produce a more elaborate version, i.e. making it more challenging. And this it does rather 
better. So the use of elaborated texts uh, in terms of extending learners' range, complexity, um, is, is, is quite rich in potential. Parallel texts, as my next category, I've, I've kind of lumped together. Um, first of all, translations. The, the technology behind ChatGPT for translating is good. Um, I've been looking at it in French and German, and um, as far as I can see, it's, it's comparable with, with the best online translation tools out there. Um, these translation tools are moving along fast. DeepL is introducing a new kind of editing service for some languages. Um, things are getting better very, very fast. So if you want to use translation in some way, and uh, you know, I, I can't even begin to give examples because there's so many, but let's say you're gonna do some kind of text based on an, some sort of activity, sorry, based on an English text with a translation into the learner's language, then ChatGPT is wonderful at producing that. The other interesting area is narrow reading. This is the idea that learners will benefit from reading um, quite a few texts on the same topic. Uh, they will benefit pr primarily in terms of lexical development uh, because they are likely to come across similar kind of lexical patterns and lexical uh, categories in these texts. So this is called narrow reading, reading the same kind of, uh, same sort of text, the same, sorry, reading different texts on the same sort of topic. An example of this might be from the real world, um, let's say taking a particular topic in the news and then reading about it from three different news sources. It's an activity which, uh, which I rate very highly. Uh, students are not always all that positive about doing it, uh, but it's something which I think they will benefit from. Here's an example of how Sam Gravel has done it, which I, again, I really liked, although I wouldn't use this particular example, but I think it's, it's a rich and imaginative idea. He put into the prompt, write three book reviews for Stephen King's Dreamcatcher. One review should be positive, one negative, and one neutral. That was the first prompt. Now, list the vocabulary and collocations for describing stories from the reviews above. And the program generated this list of, of collocations, which was a, a good list, that fairly reliable list, you need to quickly edit it. He then quickly edited the text, taking out things which he didn't think were relevant, and then showed the learners this list of collocations from the texts. He showed them the, these collocations and they had to decide as a task whether they thought this collocation came from a positive, a negative, or a neutral review, which is quite a nice way into it. And he did that before they actually read the text themselves. So a, a nice kind of structured approach to the reading with a strong lexical focus. So another way of using parallel texts. Explanations and language practice exercises, I don't want to talk about at all. My, my view is we have far too much of this stuff online already. Um, and I, we simply don't, we just don't, we don't need AI to generate any more of this crap. Thank you very much. Next, and my last category, feedback on learner language. Now, a lot of people have been talking about the use of chat GPT for getting feedback. Um, it's okay-ish. Um, it seems to be better at um, commenting on organization of, of writing and ideas than it is on language accuracy. Because as with, lang as with all of the other software that's out there, um, identifying errors is extremely hard. Um, identifying what is an error and what is a legitimate variation is harder still, because there must be some kind of norm that it measures it against. So if you want to promote in your particular context elements of translanguaging, well then chat GPT is completely lost. So it's kind of okay-ish, but it's simply not reliable. And it's, it's much like other forms of automatic writing evaluation. Um, things like the uh, Write and Improve program, for example, it can get up to about 90% accuracy, but it will identify things uh, which it thinks are wrong, which are not wrong. And it will identify things, it will not identify things which are wrong. So since it's not entirely reliable, there is a danger with using it in this, in, in, in this form. And I would recommend uh, not to do so. There are other things out there like Grammarly, which has kind of got the same, the, the same kind of reliability rate. Um, but it does lead to a normalization. And it will say things like, you know, um, it, it, will, it will encourage learners to change an element because they think it's got bad style. Whereas I think what it's recommending them to change is perfectly acceptable and should be left. 
So I wouldn't use it for that. Some, some lessons that I draw from this. All of this stuff um, can help teachers be very productive in the way that they design and plan lessons in the same way that using Google, Word, YouTube and so on, voice recorders can help us to be productive. But all of it requires quite substantial editing because you can't trust it for a minute. And there's no reason to suspect that we will ever be able to trust it enough. The ideas that I've given, I think, um, and I chose them um, because I thought they were making good use of the technology, but how good an idea is doesn't actually depend on the technology. It depends on the ideas, uh, the creativity and the understanding of language learning processes that the teachers bring to it. And there's nothing that ChatGPT is gonna do to change that. It's not gonna change the way that people teach. If anything, it's gonna reinforce the way they teach the creative, imaginative, informed language teachers will probably be able to do a more exciting job as they can with other technologies, um, but for others, no. The key thing to remember too is all of this requires quite a bit of time. So I see lots of productive potential, but I can't really see anything that's destructive or, or disruptive. The last uh, topic I wanna to turn to is um, learning rather than teaching self-directed learning. And I, I think we should be quite quick about this. This is an example, again, from Dustin Chamel, um, where he suggests that we could, the learners could use ChatGPT as a conversation partner. You'd need to build in text-to-speech and speech-to-text uh, software with this. There is a lot of talk about ChatGPT becoming a chatbot. There is a lot of talk about ChatGPT and OpenAI developing general artificial intelligence but they're not there yet. And there are reasons to suspect that they may not ever get there. This is a narrow model of intelligence designed to do relatively narrow tasks. In order for learners to learn autonomously with a chatbot, they have to have general intelligence because in the end, it's not very motivating to talk to a machine. There are other issues too. We don't yet have any kind of chatbot which can generate intelligent, non-domain specific conversation. And it may be that we will never really quite get there, although we might get to a good approximation of it. We don't have anything which is reliable in terms of speech recognition and generation. All of these programs are trained on particular speech models. And as soon as somebody comes from a different uh, speech community, the software has problems recognizing it. And that's unlikely to change because it would require uh, masses more training data than is ever likely to be invested in. We have an issue with error detection and the feedback on errors. But the biggest issues are probably that even if AI could do all of these things, could it solve the question of learner self-regulation? And there's no reason to suspect that it could. We have a huge amount of technology out there which learners can use and even when learners know what they should be doing, they tend not to do it. They don't know how to self-regulate themselves without help, and they don't know how to motivate themselves. So it's not really going to resolve the self-regulation and motivation problems. Final thought, if we did have general intelligence, artificial general intelligence, which could answer all of these challenges, who would need to learn English anyway? So my conclusion then is simply that, is it productive? Yes, it could be quite productive in both good and bad ways. Will it disrupt the way we go about teaching? No, almost certainly not. Uh, will it disrupt, destroy anything? I suspect not. Thank you. And apologize if I overrun. Um, I'll stop my screen share.